Yesterday, Kijai released the V2 for the superior wrapper nodes in Confi UI, giving us much wider hardware support, more efficient model loading, far less memory usage, and more sampler options. I felt this warranted a brand new video because everything's changed, and in my opinion, this really cements Supir as the best photo and video upscaler to date. Maybe you've seen my recent video where I've got some great 4K output out of Supir V1 nodes working hand in hand with ADLCM to secure that sweet, sweet temporal consistency or maybe you're just after something that's better than, say, Topaz. Well, you're in the right place, because in this video we're going to build the V2 workflow together, I'm going to teach you how to get the best output possible, and as per everyone's request, I will address the issue of resource management for those with lower VRAM. Let's go! First, you're going to need to install the nodes. If you've already installed Supir via GitHub, as per my last tutorial, good news, manager will detect it, and you just need to press upgrade and restart Confi, of course. If you haven't installed it yet, now is easier than ever, so just download the two Supir models, F and Q, from this GitHub page, place them into a subfolder of your checkpoints, and you're good to go. Word of caution, though, you might still need to install the requirements. Here's how. You open File Explorer, you navigate to the Supir Custom Node directory, then you type CMD, press Enter, it opens the terminal window, you invoke pip to install the requirements. That's it. What's on screen will work with the portable install of Confi, but if you're using something else such as a virtual environment or maybe a native Confi install, adapt your path accordingly, of course. Worth noting, Xformers are no longer absolutely required. You can have transformers, it won't hurt anything, and it might even make a little bit of a positive difference. You can tell if they're installed by looking at the logs when Confi starts, right here, and if you want them on, please refer to my previous videos, it's a one-line install. Let's start by adding our model loader. I'm going to pick an SDXL model I like, and I think we'll do a good job on this image, Hello World SDXL V4, which I personally favor over V5. Hey, I'm old school like that. And as always, try all your prompts, your checkpoints, your steps, and your CFG settings on a default sample workflow to gauge the output first. Workflows are not apps, at least not yet. So we're going to need to adapt all the settings, including which checkpoint we select for every single image we want to process. In terms of which supermodel you need to select, let's start with Q, which I find works well with the type of content I'm about to upscale here. But again, feel free to try F, which retains more detail but can lead to degradation at higher upscale factors. You might be wondering what's FP8, by the way. Whenever you see FP in Confi, it refers to floating point precision. The higher, usually the more details in the image, and the higher the quality, but evidently considerably more resources. So let's leave it off for now. Likewise, for diffusion type, you can flip it to a higher higher or lower precision depending on your resources, let's go for auto for now. Supir V1 was a monolithic node, wrapping a lot of different functions of Supir, which itself is a super scale stable diffusion of scalar multi-stage algorithm. I know, that's quite a mouthful. And in this new version, we've breaking it down into steps. The first step is going to be implementing a denoiser. So let's add it, and let's pass it the image that we want to upscale. Here, I want to use something realistic. Anyone can upscale these fancy images downloaded from the internet that already look good. So I'm going to start with this photo of my baby Sharpace from a few years ago, which someone had cropped and sent me via WhatsApp, so the resolution and quality is all messed up, there's no chance for me to say print this or use it as a wallpaper as it is. It's 1280 by 960 pixel resolution. It's also super hard to upscale because of the fur, plus the carpet, plus the covers. Well, you get the point, I picked the worst image possible for an upscaler. <laughs> We're presented with a bunch of options here, starting with TalViz, which is really just a way to limit your VRAM usage. This itself depends on the tile size, of course, the smaller the tile, the less memory it's going to use. But right now we're focused on learning the workflow. We'll optimize for speed, resources, and quality in just a few minutes, so bear with me, please. Let's add an image compare from RG3, and let's run this first, because this brand new denoise node has a very useful pixel output, which allows us to compare its output to the original. Let's hit Q, I can see the model loading, and this is slow the first time around, but this node is now cached. So if you remember the experience with the first few set of nodes, this will save you a lot of time as you iterate over the sampler settings of your choice further down the workflow. Let's look at the output. Wow, this is super interesting because we didn't see this step in the previous set of nodes. This is what the superior developers refer to as the first stage. And the good news is, if it's modular, we can replace it, and you could, for example, implement your own denoise here. I really love this new approach. But before we move forward, let's also add a 
we scale her here so we can constrain the image to an acceptable resolution. And be very, very mindful of this. Right now, as of March 17th, 2024, this version of Superior Wrapper only accepts resolutions in multiples of 64. So let's make sure our image conforms. This, by the way, will probably be fixed, of course, at a later date. Welcome to the Bleeding Edge, where we bleed a lot and we like it. Now we need to add the conditioner, our prompt, if you will. This is where you can get creative if you wanted to change things like eye color, stuff like that. I don't want to change my image. So I'll just add choppy dogs so that the sampler has something to work with. And of course here, you could use any image interrogator of your choice to automate and batch this. I personally like Moondream interrogator, but you can of course use VLM nodes instead or just WTiger from Python Goss. In short, use whatever works for you guys. Next is our sampler. Seed is going to be set to my usual lucky triple sevens, fixed because I don't want it to rerun it. HQ, steps need to be aligned with what's optimal for my model, and based on my experience with this checkpoint on a default workflow, I found that 50 steps and a lower CFG should get Hello World SDX LV4 to work as best as it can when it comes to fur, which is likely going to be the sticking point for any diffusion model slash upscaler here. Bit of a shame we don't have access to more restore samplers, but hey, this might change later, and having four is still better than just the one. So let's stick to DPM++ to M as it works quite well with this fine tune. Let's keep this model loaded because we're going to generate a lot of images here, so we want to keep it in RAM. But if you are low VRAM and you plan to add more things at the back or in front of this workflow, keep it unchecked, of course. Let's leave everything else by default, as we'll revisit the other settings later, if and when we need to get creative. We just need to add our encode now because the superior sampler expects a latent, of course, just like your average case sampler does. It works just like the V encoder node, by the way, but again, here you have the option to use tiled as well as affect the size of the tiles and the precisions from bfloat 16 to FP32, depending on your machine specs. I'll leave it to auto for now. Let's hook our decode before we save our image, just like we would with a V decode with a traditional case sampler. Again, here, tiled V can be adjusted. And again, it's a factor of the size of the tiles. I think you get the point by now. Be careful when you plug that V from though, you don't want to grab it from the denoiser, but from the model loader itself to keep the final output nice and sharp. And now we can place our save image. Oh, and one last thing, let's put in RG3 image compare again. Let's add watermarks to both image to keep track of what's what and a nice play sound because it's nice to get notified when the queue is completed. And let's hit Q. I really like this new system and I wish it was implemented when I upscaled countless videos for the last project I did. But it is what it is. We're not tapping into the dreaded shared VRAM thanks to the auto settings. It's very fast indeed. Now let's look at the results. The more observing viewer amongst you will have noticed that maybe nothing got upscaled. And you'd be right. You see, Supir, even with the V1 nodes, was never upscaling the image during the diffusion step. Instead, it was done earlier in the chain. Now this is good news because it means we can start using some rather interesting techniques. Of course, we could just change the image resize node settings, but why don't we just upscale by model instead? This way, we can select a downloaded model from OpenDB that's well adapted to the type of image we're working with. Because I have two dogs, I'll pick 4x Ultrasharp V10. It's a good all-rounder. But keep in mind, what you choose here is going to have a direct, very evident effect on the resulting image. It's also worth noting we need to keep the resize node here anyways. First, because of the 64 multiplier requirement I mentioned before, but also because rescale by model is arbitrary in nature. The models do 2x, 4x, and so on, so you need a further downscale to maintain that flexibility over the output. In this case, the original is 1280 by 960, and then it gets blown up by 4x by the model. So let's put it 5120, which gives us a nice 3840 pixels in vertical resolution, well, well above 2160p of a 4K frame for those keeping track. I'm going to use the fast tone image viewer here to check the output because RG3 compare is great, but it's not suitable given that the browser itself smooths out both images and rescales them using bicubic when you use the mouse wheel. It's definitely better. The fur is tough though, but that's to be expected. And remember, we haven't optimized yet for quality. Still, compare this to the Topaz output, which chokes on the fur as expected, regardless of which model I used. We're on the right track for sure. So let's continue improving our workflow. Let's have a try at the so-called old man's image. It's an image that's been making the rounds in our community because it comes from the Magnific homepage and it's a fun example to play with. It's 688 by 688 and it's quite compressed. We're going to upscale it of course and in the process we're going to learn more about superior VRAM's usage. I conducted many many generations and my first recommendation is that for most people setting everything to auto is definitely the best choice. It's obvious that Kijai listened very carefully to the feedback from the V1 nodes and has done a really good job at 
getting those settings to adjust correctly based on your existing VRAM when everything is set to auto. But the beauty of the multi-stage system is that you can now affect the distribution of the RAM between the stages. So for example, I found that even with 1440p inputs, the denoise step, the encode step, and the decode all fit within an 8 gig of VRAM without any issue as they run in series even within large frames. Now, do not confuse this for the sampler VRAM usage itself though, they are completely independent of each other. You may be able to decode, encode at a certain resolution, but that doesn't necessarily guarantee being able to denoise at that resolution. So for example, when I switch the settings to maximum precision everywhere, the exact same image that took only 15 gig of RAM a second ago overflowed into shared VRAM, which, top tip if this ever happens to you, means having to interrupt the process by restarting the server. The setting you're really looking for if you have very low VRAM, such as 8 gig, is this one, the UNET Precision, which once set to FP8 will drastically lower your VRAM usage to the very strict minimum. Now, of course, this comes with a degradation in quality, but that's to be expected. And ultimately, VRAM usage is correlated to the size of the latent you pass to the sampler. So if you're having problems despite having set everything to the absolute minimum, your best option is to simply use smaller latent around 1080p or similar. In this video, you can see me upscaling a 320p image to 1080p in FP8 using SDXL at 35 steps, not lightning, using only 5 gigabytes of VRAM. Now, if you're wondering why it says a different number than 5, that's because my screen recorder takes at least 3 gig of RAM just to operate. And for those of you with more than 16 gig of RAM, note that it's not necessary to go and use FP32 every single time. In fact, the FP16 quality is really excellent. On all the pictures that I upscaled, I really couldn't tell the difference between FP16 and FP32. That's unless, of course, the restoration scale was set way high and the denoise gets to be visible so you get to see more of the underlying model. But let's be honest, that's an edge case. Do you remember in my last video I created an option to use Animate Diff with either LCM or SDXL Lightning to accelerate the Ultimate SD Upscaler by a factor of 5? Well, the same can be done here. First, we need to switch to a Lightning model, but do note that some require very specific settings which you need to check on their respective Civit AI page. Some of them also require very specific samplers, so make sure to adjust the sampler settings accordingly. Here, I'm going to modify the steps in the sampler to whatever the checkpoint creator recommended, in my case that's 10 step with a CFG of 2 or lower, then I'm going to run it. And oh boy, is this fast or what? In fact, it looks like the encode and the decode took longer than the sampler. Well, that was easy. But before we move on, let me show you how the tiling work. We're going to add this node to our input image and change the parameters to whatever our sampler is using. And bang, we can see how it thinks inside of it. It's a really fun way to learn, but do note though that this is not something you're going to use as part of the workflow outside of getting a visual reference for your own understanding. Once you've trialed out a few models and you're satisfied that the one you picked will have an output that matches your original image once diffused, you need to change some settings in the sampler. First, let's disable the upscale by model. We'll turn it back on, but it's really affecting the image and giving it a very, very specific, I would say almost an immediately noticeable look. And I want to show you that we can get a perfectly good results out of the superior sampler with a simple length of three size. Ultimately, the sampler is where the real works happen, the diffusion stage. This is the heavy lifting. Let's see if we can bring the SDXL lightning quality near to the levels of the regular SDXL. We're going to need to keep the steps and the CFG identical, as that's rather arbitrary due to the use of lightning, but we can definitely loosen the control net. This is going to give more free reign to the model and in some case, do just enough creative work to improve the look and feel of the image. We should also up the image recovery settings or else the output is going to look quite noisy. Oh, and be very, very careful with your prompts at this point, unless you want the previously used dog to appear right in the middle of this man's face. Now, while I process this, I want to point out a couple of things. First, you're giving more free reign to the model, so that seed is going to vary the output slightly. And second, and perhaps more importantly, you might be wondering what's the difference between what we're doing here and recreating the whole process by A, denoising an image, B, tiling it with tile diffusion, C, using control nets for the structure, and then passing a latent to a model to a regular case sampler with a low denoise and something like a tiled V decode. And the answer is the control net in Supir is the magic sauce. It's the most advanced one for SDXL at the present moment. But of course, nothing stops you from upscaling your image in the way that's most optimal for the subject in question. In fact, that should be your prerogative. There you go. So that's the output. Let's compare it to SDXL regular. And I think it's very promising. It's a great technique for fast results. It's extremely fast, but based on my test on much larger images, SDXL regular still has a little edge. 
If you watch my last super video, the first one, this image of a Jeep had me scratching my head. I couldn't get it to get over the massive JPEG artifacting, I couldn't get super not to draw mountains where there shouldn't be any, and the car looked like this. But with this new set of nodes, I thought I'd give it another try. So let's change our settings again. Let's bump restoration to 10 and let's see where it takes us. Bang, got it on first try. Now, this really goes to show that this new node set can really help with specific outputs that would have been otherwise much, much harder to get to before. The geometry of the vehicle is really good too. Sure, the plate still doesn't read correctly, but hey, that's SDXL for you. Maybe with SD3. Oh, and here's a bonus feature. Let's change the color of the car. We can simply add yellow to the prompt, turn the CFG to something really high like 5, and voila. Now, remember, we're still dependent on our underlying model, evidently, but yes, it works. And of course, it changed the mountain. And of course, you should still use a mask for something like this. But if you ask me, the detail on the road is pretty sweet, and it's hard to beat the turnaround time. When using Supir, you might encounter some problems, and I want to help you resolve them before they happen. First, if you get a message that says something along the likes of size of tensors must match except in dimension 1 or something like that, you're just not passing an image that's in a resolution of a multiplier of 64. Now again, this might be fixed by the time you watch this video in the GitHub repo, but I had to wrap the recording before Kijai could push on yet another update. Yeah, it's, it's every day, bro. Another error you might get states something like error in loading stats dictionary. Now this is likely because you're passing to Supir the wrong type of model. This only works with SDXL and SDXL Lightning for now, so be careful. Also, if your image is cooked, now evidently it's probably because you left way too many steps on a Lightning model. And if you get an error about tensors expected on the same device, it's because you're not encoding the image as a latent before you pass it to the case sampler, so go check your noodles. And finally, if you get this specific error about recursion, you wired the nodes incorrectly. Check the workflow I posted on Floaty and try again. To be clear, Supir is not a generic upscaler that works with default settings on all inputs. This isn't a limitation of Supir, it's just the way Confi works, period. The correct way to work until certain things go to market <clears throat> is to have one workflow with one set of settings per image. But Supir, once you get comfortable with it and iterate a bit, is an amazing upscaler. And the new addition of these nodes make it a no-brainer. There's a lot of things we could explore, such as replacing the first stage denoiser. So if you build something cool, don't be shy and go show us your work on Discord. I'll be porting these nodes to my video generation framework. And talking about videos, there's some great ones on your screen right now, complete with workflows, so go check them out. Thanks for watching guys and I'll see you in the next one.